and welcome to The Process. I am your host, Cassie Linder, and today I'm here with Miss Jenny Boyd, author and psychologist. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming in today. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. So you are the author of a book called It's Not Only Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what the book is about? The book is about um, the creative process. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed 75 musicians, mm -hmm. famous musicians, and asked them about each one of them, different aspects of creativity. Mm. So it was, to begin with, I'd ask them what uh, the importance of nurturing mm -hmm. and whether they were nurtured as children. Mm -hmm. um, also, the drive to create, um, where some people have it, some people don't, and it was those that have a strong drive to create were the ones that made it. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, a lot of them spoke about it being a sense of destiny. That's what it was. And for them, because they were famous musicians, I'm sure there was a sense of destiny. Mm -hmm. um, also, we talk about the unconscious, what's actually going on when they're writing or playing their instrument, mm. and the collective unconscious, what it is that they're, they're like the sort of um, spokespeople of our time. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, drugs and alcohol, what mm -hmm. part that plays. And I also asked them whether they felt everybody has the potential to be creative or whether it's just a gift for a few. Hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. 75. 75. How long did that take you? Well, it actually took me, it was over a period of four years. Okay. And in its way, it was a very creative process for me uh, in as much as there was a lot of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And I know that when, you know, because I write, and when you're writing and suddenly things just seem to come out of nowhere, it was that same feeling where um, I would only need to think of somebody I would like to interview. And either somebody I know would say, well, I know them, or mm -hmm. my friend knows them. And, uh, you know, so I had Ravi Shankar and George Harrison when he was alive, because this was written 20 years ago. It was um, actually a dissertation mm -hmm. and turned out into a book. Uh, that got published in America and Japan, never in England. And hmm. then a year and a half ago, only 20 years later, the Eng an English publisher picked it up and okay. it's now called It's Not Only Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. So I edited a bit and out of the 75 musicians, 11 of them are no longer with us. People mm -hmm. like George Harrison, Ravi Shankar and you know, there, are, there are a few others. Mm -hmm. But um, And it was just the most amazing, wonderful process. And, mm. um, and all the musicians I interviewed loved the interviews. And all of them said they were very thought-provoking and, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. What did that have to play with this idea? Was it something that you were always interested in, in the creative process from a psychologist's perspective or from an artist's perspective? Well, I never felt creative mm -hmm. as a kid, even though I always wrote. It was such a natural thing for me. I would write poems and I would lament how uncreative I am. And, you know, so I never felt I was... Um, creative because I never really felt I was able to express myself, mm -hmm. who I am. Um, I suppose the person that really uh, gave me the idea without realizing it was Eric Clapton because when I lived in England before I went back to live in LA, um, he, he was married to my sister then. And um, he was, you know, real sort of imbiber and so um, he would often say, well, he wasn't special in any way. He was just like the man next door or the man on the bus. There was nothing about him that was special. Mm -hmm. And um, and I didn't agree because I thought, well, he has a talent. Mm -hmm. He has an obvious talent. And I wondered whether he drank to excess or, you know, used drugs because maybe the gift or the talent was too much for him to bear. Mm -hmm. And um, and that got me thinking about other musicians because oh, because then you know I was married to Mick Fleetwood and so I knew you know all the Fleetwood Mac of those musicians and then my second husband was um, a drummer called Ian Wallace and who mm -hmm. he played with Bob Dylan and Crosby Stills and Nash and Bonnie Raitt and so you know I had a lot of musicians that I'd known for quite a while mm -hmm. but um, but so I started asking them and then I realised that there were some musicians that didn't drink, very few at that time, mm -hmm. we're sort of talking like 80s. Um, and I noticed with those particular musicians, there seemed to be something about them, they seemed to be more in touch with their spiritual, I sensed, side of themselves. So anyway, years later, when, um, when Eric had, uh, had stopped drinking, I, um, 
I interviewed him. He was one of one of the musicians, and I told him about this, mm -hmm. and he said yes. It was daunting. He did feel he had this gift, and it was like a time staring into the face of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it was amazing that so many were sober, and they yes, felt exactly. even closer. You know, exactly more in touch with their. And so the brilliant thing activity. was, you know, is people like David Crosby. You know, he was no longer using, mm -hmm. and so they were able to speak very openly about what parts drugs and alcohol played for mm -hmm. them you know mm -hmm. Bonnie rate the same and a lot of the fear that if they stop using would be that they weren't wouldn't be creative anymore and for Bonnie that was just before her Nick of Time album mm -hmm. that was huge mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that was great you know because I think it wouldn't have been as interesting if I'd done it maybe 10 years before when people were still using because mm -hmm. you wouldn't know you know they wouldn't be able yeah. to be objective about it